Uh, the first speaker is uh, Richard Lim, a distinguished psychologist. He was born in 1930 and obtained a PhD, PhD degree in psychology from the University of Cambridge. <coughs> he has been a lecturer in psychology at the University of Exeter, a professor of psychology at the, of psychology at the Economic and Social Research Institute uh, Dublin from uh, 1967 to 72 and professor and head of uh, the department at, uh, of psychology at the University of Ulster in, uh, from 1972 to 95. Now professor emeritus. His main work has been on intelligence and uh, personality. His books include Personality and National Character, published in, in 72, uh, Educational Achievement in Japan, published in 88, this genics published in 96, second revised uh, version in, in 2011. IQ and the wealth of nation uh, published in 2002. Uh, race differences in uh, intelligence published in 2006. The global bell curve published in 2008. And the chosen people, a study of Jewish intelligence and achievements published two years ago. Uh, please welcome Richard. <coughs> Thank you. I should begin by explaining that the uh, theme of this presentation is dysgenics. And I should probably just say a word about what dysgenics is. Dysgenics is the opposite of eugenics, which is probably a more familiar concept to you all. It was keenly supported by Hitler and acquired a bad name on that account. So today, if anyone makes a proposal and someone says, hang on a minute, isn't that eugenic? That is enough to damn it. Now, dysgenics is the opposite of eugenics. Eugenics is the uh, science, or some say the pseudoscience, of improving the genetic quality of a population and improving it in respect of its intelligence and its moral character. The, uh, the term eugenics was invented by Francis Galton, a cousin of Charles Darwin in 1883 and Galton believed that the genetic quality of the population in Britain and other economically developed countries was declining and that eugenics was the solution to this problem. Galton did not actually use the word dysgenics to designate the decline in the genetic quality of the population I believe this was first used by Leonard Darwin in 1914, in the, about a, a month after the outbreak of the First World War, in a letter to the Times, in which he suggested that war, and in particular this war that we were fighting against Germany, that this war is dysgenic. I believe this may be the first use of the word. His argument was that the best of the young men were uh, volunteering to fight in France uh, and leaving the less good behind, so that the, uh, the better quality people were, to, were, were being killed and would be killed, uh, and that this would have a dysgenic effect. Actually, the idea of uh, eugenics is not new to Galton in the 19th century, but appears in Plato's Republic, in which uh, Socrates proposes that the citizens should be bred for improved qualities in the same way that people have bred domestic animals and crops for many centuries. It was well known at that time. Well, now, we, <clears throat> we today 
are living, we the European peoples, which is why I call this a problem, we are living in an age of dysgenics and have been for a little more than a century. That is to say, our, the genetic quality of our populations has been deteriorating in these two respects, intelligence and moral character. And uh, this is a result of two facts, factors. One is dysgenic fertility, and the second is dysgenic immigration. Dysgenic fertility took place earlier than dysgenic immigration. Dysgenic fertility means that people with higher intelligence and better moral qualities are having relatively few children. Uh, and as these qualities have some genetic basis, uh, the result of this is that the genetic quality of the population deteriorates. Um, this began, gen dysgenic fertility began around the last decade of the 19th century and is attributable to the invention of the condom in the uh, 1970s. <coughs> the condom was known before this and is attributed to the Comte de Condom, a French nobleman from, this, from the town of, of Condom in southwest France, <laughs> who uh, invented this artifact by the use of sheep's intestine cut into suitable lengths and knotted at the end. But these condoms were not particularly favoured by the public. And it was the invention of the latex problem condom, as it is known today in Germany in the 1870s, that heralded the advent of dysgenic fertility. And the reason for that is that once the condom was invented, it would inevitably be used more effectively and efficiently by people who are intelligent and people who are, resp who are responsible than by those who are unintelligent and those who are irresponsible. And so we uh, saw the introduction of an era in which the intelligent and responsible people began to have fewer children than the unintelligent and the irresponsible. This was first picked up in census returns from about the beginning of the 20th century, which showed that the middle classes, who are in general more intelligent and more responsible than the laboring classes, that the middle classes were having fewer children than the labouring classes. And in the uh, third decade of the 20th century, following the invention of the intelligence test, it began to be shown in a number of studies that intelligent people were having fewer children than unintelligent people. And I show you here on this overhead I don't know whether you can see. Can it be blown up in any way? Is it legible? Probably not. It is. Well, you should see here the top line, right? The top two rows are with children and without children. And the first line is men. This is data collected and not yet published by Satoshi Kanazawa from the London School of Economics of 9,000 plus adults in Britain. Here we see men, those with children have an IQ of 102.2 and those without children had an IQ of 103. Only quite a small difference, but nevertheless a British difference that is present. But among women you'll see that the difference is greater. Women with children have an IQ of 
whereas those without children have an IQ of 105.3. These are people aged 47 and therefore whose fertility is virtually complete. You'll see here, this, is, this, this illustrates the dysgenic problem in this little bit of data here, but it's been shown in many European peoples in other countries. You'll see here that the dysgenic problem is greater for women than it is for men. This is also a very common finding in research on this issue. <coughs> so the problem is that intelligent, well-educated women are ceasing to have children. That is the major component of this problem. And the problem for the eugenicists, I hope that I will convert some of you to the eugenic position before this morning is done. The problem of the eugenicists is how to persuade or motivate intelligent women to have more children. <coughs> the problem is that intelligent and ed well educated women obtain satisfying careers early in their 20s. Many of them we know from polling data, many of them intend to have children, but not yet. They postpone it, and then they postpone it again into their 30s. And then for various reasons, they find it is too late to have children. Fertility declines, and suitable men have been snapped up by the time women get into their thirties. That is the nub of the problem. Now, this dysgenic fertility is present within countries all over the European peoples. But it is also present across the whole world. The intelligent peoples and the conscientious peoples. These are the European peoples and the peoples of the Far East in Japan and Singapore and places. The intelligent peoples are having fewer children than the unintelligent peoples and the unconscientious peoples of South, Af South, of, uh, <coughs> South Asia and uh, North Africa and the more unintelligent people still of uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So all over the uh, economically developed world of the European peoples and the Far East Asian peoples, uh, fertility is below replacement. I, that is to say, we are not replacing our population. For the population to replace itself, each woman should have on average 2.1 children. There's nowhere in the economically developed world where women are having an average of 2.1 children. And some of these, uh, what are called total fertility rates, are very low. In Singapore, they are one, i.e. the average, the average number of children per woman is one. So the population declines by half in every generation. And, uh, Many European countries, like Italy and Spain, it's around 1.2, Germany a little higher, but nowhere is the population replacing itself. On the other hand, the populations in sub-Saharan Africa have a total fertility rate of around six. So these low IQ peoples in these parts of the world are multiplying up, while the high IQ peoples of Europe and East Asia are declining, meaning that the intelligence of the world is declining, and so too is the conscientiousness of the world, because these race differences in intelligence are paralleled by race differences in conscientiousness or moral character. Now, that is then the first dysgenic process uh, characterizing the modern world. And uh, the second 
consists of the dysgenics of immigration all over the uh, Western Europe, United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, immigrants with lower intelligence and lower moral character are entering these countries uh, and replacing the indigenous peoples Uh, so great is this phenomenon, the dysgenics of immigration, that we will, we the Europeans, will within the foreseeable future become minorities in our own countries. This is going to occur in approximately 30 years time in the United States. Europeans will become a minority of the population in the United States in approximately 30 years' time and a dwindling minority thereafter. As a result, a continued immigration of non-European peoples, mainly Hispanics from Mexico, who are of course not European peoples, many of them, but hybrids of European and Native American Indians or pure Native American Indians. Uh, from uh, this tipping point onwards in approximately 30 years time when the European peoples will become a minority, the European peoples will become an ever dwindling minority in the United States. This I think must inevitably herald the end of the United States as the world superpower, as the century moves on. The United States will become just another Latin American country with European peoples as a minority of the population. It will become like Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, Peru, and places of that kind certainly no longer the world's superpower. The uh, replacement of the indigenous peoples by non-European immigrants is also occurring at a rapid rate in Western Europe and we are not far behind the United States in this regard. It is estimated that in Britain the indigenous peoples will become a minority of the population in approximately 40 years time. Uh, this is a result of uh, large-scale immigration, principally from the Indian subcontinent, but also from Africa and the Caribbean, and from the high fertility of those once they arrive here. So that, for example, in the Bangladeshi and Pakistani community, the average numbers of children is around five, whereas the average number of children, total fertility rate of the indigenous English is around 1.7. <coughs> but furthermore, the numbers of of these, in this, these communities is increased by arranged marriages. Of the five children, four of them are married to partners in the subcontinent and therefore are able to come to Britain as spouses of citizens. So for every couple who produce five children, another four come into the country. So inevitably, the numbers of these peoples multiplies up while those of the indigenous population decreases. And we can see this with our own eyes as we walk the streets of London and see how few English there are to be seen there. The rest of continental Europe, Western Europe, not Eastern Europe, Western Europe, France, the Netherlands and so forth, is experiencing much the same dysgenic immigration 
as we are in Britain. <coughs> These are, this trend of this, 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 this genetic immigration can be blamed in the United States on J.F. Kennedy who wrote a book called A Nation of Immigrants somewhere around the year 1960 in which he argued we shouldn't have uh, quotas such that uh, immigrants are favoured from Northwest Europe uh, well, they should all be allowed to come and live in the United States and when he became president he set in motion an act the 1965 Act, Immigration Act to uh, allow immigrants from everywhere to come in and he was assassinated before the act was, became law but it was seen through by his successor Lyndon Johnson and by his younger brother Teddy known to us as the murderer of Chappaquiddick. He was seen through the Congress by Teddy and it was that that ushered in the age of mass immigration of non-Europeans into the United States. In Britain, the people responsible for the mass immigration of non-Europeans were first of all Clement Attlee, Prime Minister of the Labour government of 1945, who passed the Commonwealth Citizenship Act in 48, which um, allowed all members of the British Commonwealth to come and live, and colonies, to come and live in Britain. All one million or so of them, bil one billion or so of them, consisting of the Indian subcontinent, about half of Africa, uh, Caribbean, and a few odd islands. And so they came in. So we have to blame him as the first person, I believe, responsible for this dysgenic immigration. But I think we should also blame Winston Churchill, who became Prime Minister in 1951 or 52. And he did nothing to stop this. He was Prime Minister for, three or for four or five years. He did nothing to stop the immigration of non-European peoples into Britain. It was not until around 1962 that when Harold Macmillan was Prime Minister that he actually put a stop to this, but of course it was too late by then. There were so many in here that they were able to bring in their relations. They had enclaves in which they could uh, welcome illegals and people who overstayed. So I blame those two. Now, those who have been concerned with this problem and who think it is a serious problem that we the European peoples are degenerating as a result of these two uh, <coughs> phenomena dysgenic fertility and dysgenic immigration those, those who are concerned with this problem have put their mind to the question of how this can be arrested and put into reverse what can be done to save us, the European peoples, from this impending disaster. This is a question which Francis Galton put his mind to and it is a very difficult question to answer. I think the first thing we have to take on board in thinking about solutions to this problem is that it cannot be solved in a liberal democracy. The, the countervailing forces against trying to stem these, uh, these dysgenic trends are too strong. They can only be solved in an oligarchy such as that is in China or in a a dictatorship. So the first thing we must hope for is a military coup <laughs> in one of the European countries 
we hope that some Franco or Pinochet figure will say we have to handle this problem and take control. When he does this, if and when this happens, or should I say if and if this happens, if I were his advisor, his eugenic advisor on how to deal with the problem, I would suggest the following steps. There are two problems. We have to encourage the elites to have more children. This is known as positive eugenics. And secondly, we have to discourage the non-elites from having children. As far as encouraging the elites to have more children, we must focus particularly on elite women. As I mentioned a little bit earlier. So how do we persuade them to have more children? I think we do it by financial incentives and penalties. First of all, we tax them very highly from the age of, say, 26 onwards. So if they hadn't had children, we'd begin to tax them very heavily. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of taxing those who won't have children was first devised by the Emperor Augustus, the first Roman Emperor. About He had the same problem that we had today, that the elites in Rome were not having uh, sufficient children. So he put taxes on those who didn't have children. So we've stolen his idea. We put massive, whatever it takes, we put massive taxes on those who don't have children. But at the same time, we give massive incentives to those financial incentives to those who do have children. So the upshot of this is that with the carrot and the stick, they may as well have children. They get a lot of money for it. And uh, they uh, don't get taxed out of uh, uh, so heavily. Um, so I think this would, should do the trick. Of course, this has to be targeted only on the elite. That is why it couldn't be done in a democracy. You couldn't, just, you couldn't in a democracy, say we're giving these incentives just to, say, university graduates to take this as a rule of, rule, rule of thumb measure of the elite. The only in an authoritarian state uh, could this be done. Um, so that, would, that, is the, uh, that is how we would deal with the uh, positive eugenics, encouraging the elites to have more children by fiscal incentives. And at the same time, we have to discourage uh, the less desirable from having children. We should certainly revive the sterilization of the mentally retarded. This was very widely used in the United States and in many continental countries in Europe in the first half of the 20th century. It was first introduced in the state of Indiana in 1913 and spread to most of the states over the next two decades. Um, <coughs> and uh, it was also used in many European countries but after the Second World War, with the increasing sentimentalization of the European public peoples, it was phased out in the uh, 1960s. So this must be revived in the eugenic state. <coughs> but we should probably also extend negative eugenics a bit further and we could adopt the proposal put forward by Francis Galton himself. He suggested the concept of licenses for parents. The general principle is borrowed from the car or from our American friends automobile license. Um, just as people are not permitted to drive on the public highway unless they have been shown to be fit by taking a driving test, otherwise they are a danger to the public. So we should extend this principle to parenthood. 
You, couldn't just, you shouldn't just allow people to become parents, no matter how unfitted they are for this. They should be required to take a test, administered by people like ourselves, <laughs> <coughs> to determine whether they are fit to be parents. Galton proposed a graded, not a pass or fail, but a graded system. Some who failed, the t those who failed the test would not be allowed to have any children. Uh, those who scraped a bare pass would be allowed one, and those who did a little moderately would be allowed two, and those who did well would be allowed to have as many as they liked. We should probably have to introduce a system of that kind in the eugenic state. As I say, I think the likelihood of a eugenic state being introduced following a military coup in a European country is probably rather remote. And the best hope for a eugenic future lies with China, where a strong oligarchic state might well introduce policies of this kind. Thank you. Now, uh, of course, I really uh, have to thank you and I appreciate your work. Um, so I come from Costa Rica, which uh, is a Latin American country where uh, the traditional uh, notion of intergenerational progress has been of whitening of the population. Unfortunately, the cultural Protestant uh, influence of the U.S. Uh, has uh, imported notions of affirmative action and all such nonsense. But uh, yeah, I would have to say that the Haredi Jews is perhaps a uh, eugenic population with a high birth rate. And uh, I would not put my trust in the East Asians, because one thing that, uh, in my opinion, is particularly characteristic of the Europeans is the high verbal IQ, not just the spatial visual IQ, which uh, led to Aristotelian logic and, and verbal deductive analysis. And uh, that is not very common of the East Asians. I think this is correct that uh, the Hasidic Jews are an exception to this rule that the European peoples are not replacing themselves everywhere. There are, there are not very many, I don't know quite how many of them are there, maybe 50,000 or so perhaps. There are not very many of them, but I, I can see that they are an exception. If we had, instead of any politics, private property, we would then have private streets and freedom of association. To what extent do you think it's possible that this would be able to internalize the externalities that I freely admit immigrants can impose upon the indigenous population? I, from my point of view, I think this is a better solution to the problem because it doesn't actually require imposing on anybody. It simply puts them in, into areas where they bear the costs of their own behaviour and as a consequence they then learn from that to improve their behaviour and you don't have to associate with them at all if you don't wish to within your private sphere. Well I think the larger problem is it might be difficult to enforce uh, the segregation uh, hypothesis but also these are genetic Qualities. The, the, these third world immigrants are genetically inferior to us in respect of uh, intelligence and moral qualities. So it wouldn't handle that problem either. I don't think they would uh, kind of become Europeans. Of course, that's, this is the politically correct theory that these people would all become like Europeans. But I don't think this is true. This will actually happen. Well, they live in ghettos. They live in ghettos. Yes. Uh, one, one question. I I, I don't uh, agree completely with your talk, but I, I liked it, uh, Phil. <laughs> um, 
you know, you can't be accused of being a, a bleeding heart liberal, which is a great, great compliment. <laughs> um, what about um, uh, Russia? Russia to today. You know, I have the sense that, for example, Putin has a, a great understanding of uh, pretty much everything that you have been uh, talking about. And we are seeing some signs that he want, wants to <coughs> implement a, a policy uh, where he uh, encourages uh, you know Russians to have more children, etc. Yes. Do you have any comments well, on it's that? Quite, I've read in the press, as you, know, you have, and other people, that Putin is much concerned, with, um, particularly with the, just with the declining birth rate in Russia, and therefore the decline in the population, which is uh, a serious problem in Russia, just as it is elsewhere among the European peoples. Whether he has uh, devised incentives for the elites to have more children, I'm afraid I don't know. You mentioned briefly that this problem was faced in the classical age. Do you think this in, could be in the classical age? Yes, yes. Do you think that the same was also true in the Bronze Age and that this could be part of a natural cycle? I think it's only in civilizations that this. Uh, <coughs> development of uh, ch voluntary childlessness has taken place. Normally in the Bronze Age and other phases of prehistory, there will be natural fertility, i.e. natural women will have about six children on average over their life cycle. And this will normally be eugenic insofar as those who are looked after better by their parents have greater survival. And um, it's only, I think, with the development of a high civilization like that we had in Rome in the time of Augustus that for some reason or other, elites decide not to have children or to have very few children. I have another question. Um, firstly, I've, in my school year, we have 90, we had, uh, 90 people. Now, 90 people, only seven have had children, and I'm 30. So I completely understand where you're coming from because I would never have imagined that 10 years ago. There's so few people have had children and people in my year are reasonably intelligent. My question would be, what kind of test would you, would you do? Would it be solely intelligence or would it be more the upbringing of the children and how they would like to, um, to, to further that? Is it, is it just intelligence? To encourage elites. Yes. <coughs> Would it just well, be intelligent or would it be culture and upbringing and the kind of lifestyle and understanding today? It would be better to capture personality qualities in addition to intelligence because personality qualities are important. And they're both captured quite well by graduates. Um, but what you say about your experience of your <coughs> former schoolmates is very, very common. We had, it was well expressed by a woman in Britain. Um, called Lucy Worsley. She's the keeper of the Queen's pictures and she's quite a high profile figure in the arts world of Britain in her early 40s, childless. She said, I have been educated out of my biological function. I thought it expressed it very well. Um, yeah, I have one more question. Intelligence is changing through generations. For example, people who immigrated to the United States after the Second World War, the immigrants, their IQ was very, very low. But then after a generation, their children, uh, their IQ was much higher. In the same way, the numbers you're giving, for example, women without children is 101 IQ. Mm. It's still, uh, this 101 number is in comparison to current population. Still, the, the, these women are much more intelligent than their mothers and grandmothers in the previous generations, even if they had like one, 105. In other words, once the, the society is developing, uh, general IQ, if you would compare it to generations, raises anyway, even though it might stay, even though it stays at the number 100. So how do you respond to that? What you say is quite correct, that the, the decline of the genetic policy of the population has been masked by improvements in education and nutrition which have caused actual IQs to rise over much of the 20th century, although they have now begun to decline 
from over the last 25 years or so in a number of countries, including Britain. So that's a kind of minor hiccup on the analysis. As far as immigration, immigrants are concerned, it's quite true uh, that uh, impoverished immigrants coming into the states from southern Europe and eastern Europe uh, in the 1920s uh, had quite low IQs. And their IQs improved as uh, the environment, it's the same phenomenon, but environmental <coughs> improvements, IQs could go up and, uh, and masking a genetic decline. Um, the example of, uh, of Orthodox uh, Jews, doesn't it show that uh, religion could be a, uh, the solution? That, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, through, through religion we could, uh, um, you know, um, manage the, uh, the problem, encourage the people to have uh, uh, more children, and, you know, through, through some religious hierarchy, encourage the right kind of people to have uh, children. Would that not be possible? You know, Orthodox Jews, uh, you could argue, have had that kind of uh, system? Um. Well, whether this could be done by encouragement from the churches, I think is a little bit unlikely. The churches are apt to take the view that there are enough people in the world without us adding to them. I, I don't know. I wouldn't be optimistic about there being much mileage in that, I'm afraid. <laughs> Thank you very much. The title of his talk is Electing a New People in America and England. Please give a warm welcome to Peter Grimble. Uh Thank you, Oscar. Um, I've tried to be a seller, but nobody will buy. <laughs> uh, uh, thanks, Andy and, and Emma and Caroline for, for inviting me here today. Uh, as some of you will be able to tell from my accent, I am actually an immigrant or an emigrant myself. Uh, I was born in the UK and I've lived in the US uh, about for, well about 40 years ago my twin brother and I decided that uh, all was lost here in the UK and we, we moved ourselves to the Anglosphere's last redoubt, uh, uh, the US. Now of course we think all is lost there too but we're going to go down fighting. Actually what the, uh, what the last 40 years have, have taught us or taught me is, is that you know, in the, there's a, a wonderful book about, the, about screenwriting in Hollywood called Adventures in the Screen Trade, written by a, a guy called William Goldman. I to hold on to my time here. And, and uh, the, the central point of this book is that, as he puts it, nobody expletively de expletive deleted knows. Nobody expletive deleted knows. Nobody knows what's going to work uh, or in Hollywood. They just don't know what, whether, whether some, what film's going to work or not. Uh, and similarly, uh, you know, nobody expletive deleted knew that the West was going to win the Cold War. Uh, by um, the end of, uh, after the fall of Vietnam in 75, it was a common assumption among the American conservative movement, which I was deeply involved in, that we were going to lose, that the red flag would one day wave over the world. But it didn't happen. Now, I know that none of you millennials here believe that, uh, because you never heard the Cold War. <laughs> Nobody under 40 seems to know anything about the Cold War, except possibly Lydia, who's here heard me going on about it a great deal. And I know that she always believes everything I say. And I think Andy Duncan might understand it too, because he was on the other side. <laughs> uh, that's right. But anyway, the moral I draw from this is that uh, cultural Marxism can be defeated just like the classical Marxists were. Uh, uh, one of the areas where nobody knows, incidentally, is in fact uh, uh, demographics, uh, population growth. I mean, nobody really knows why fertility rates fluctuate, as I'm sure you agree, Richard. I mean, there was this amazing period after the Second World War when, when the baby boomers happened uh, for a period of, of uh, nearly 20 years. 
uh, uh, women did have uh, 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 well above <laughs> replacement fertility uh, uh, all over the Western world. It's something that seems to happen after wars. Maybe we need a good war, uh, but we don't know what's going to happen with, the, with fertility rates and, and, and this kind of thing. Re we don't really know what's, go what's going to happen next, which is kind of a hopeful thing. Uh, the title of my talk, of course, uh, I'm about to say, when, it, when Andy was talking to me about this talk, he said, basically, don't be too libertarian, I, you know, he doesn't want to be put too... Anyway, I think Richard has solved that problem. He's, on, he's, <laughs> <laughs> he's eliminated the libertarian uh, I issue here. We don't have to worry about being too libertarian anymore. The average level of libertarianism is uh, so it's a lot lower than it was uh, before he spoke. Uh, uh, the title of my talk is a reference to the famous poem that uh, Bertolt Brecht wrote, after the 53 risings against the communist government in East Germany. It goes, uh, the English translation, after the uprising of the 17th of June, the secretary of the Writers' Union had, had leaflets distributed in the Stalin Ali, stating that the people had forfeited the confidence of the government and could only win it back by redoubled efforts. And then Brett concluded, would it not be easier in that case for the government to dissolve the people and elect another? How many of you heard of this? How many of you heard of this poem? <coughs> That's very interesting. Uh, I've been talking about this poem for, for, for 30 years with the result that if you Google it, some of my talks actually show up. So I'm afraid I haven't made very much headway. But I still, th I still think that it, it's, a, it's a good po point because that's exactly what's happening in the Western world. The governments are dissolving the people and electing a new one, and specifically in this case in, in the US and the UK. Um, Uh, I'm going to have to put my glasses on to look at this thing. Um, because what's looking at here, you know, is a government policy. It's very easy. What most libertarians do sort of dogmatically assume that, you know, coming across the border is a, is a good thing and, and uh, they don't think about it any much more than that. So for the benefit of any primary or idiopathic libertarians here, I, I want to emphasise this. What we're looking at is a government pass. The government determines who can come in. It's now primarily non-traditional or, or third world. How many can come in? A lot, much more than was uh, anticipated. One of the things about government policy on immigration is it consistently underestimates what the flow is going to be. Uh, when Teddy Kennedy put through the... Uh, the uh, 65 Immigration Act that Richard mentioned in the US, they said that the immigration would increase by maybe a couple of hundred thousand, uh, and that it would die away. <laughs> in fact, it's been a million a year since then, uh, the greatest influx in American history. Um, and, and the same exactly is true in the US, I mean, in the UK. I mean, uh, when the, there was a serious study done about Poland when, when, the British, when they were thinking about whether to stop the Poles from coming in, which they had the right to do. They could temporarily delay Poles <coughs> coming in, even though after Poland joined the EU. And the Home Office estimated that the flow would be minuscule, minuscule. In fact, that's half a million Poles moved to the UK, and it's the largest immigration into, into the US, in, into the UK in a thousand years. Um, now, in, in both cases, it happened accidentally. Uh, in the UK, as... as, uh, as uh, 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 Richard mentioned, uh, the government triggered non-traditional immigration in '45 by, by the Commonwealth uh, Citizenship Act, um, it, which they define to, they define citizen, British citizenship to include members uh, of the, of the, uh, uh, everybody who was uh, technically a member of the Commonwealth. So that's a really interesting thing that they did because in 1947, they, of course, the, India had become independent. Uh, and the next step is to, is to say that all Indians can come to the UK. Very odd. I think in some ways it was almost an act of imperial nostalgia. I don't think, uh, if you look at the debates at the time, there was a lot of sort of delusion about what was in Britain, about what they'd actually done. And, and um, uh, the, 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 the conventional wisdom was that they weren't really through giving away the empire. They were, they were uh, uh, reformulating it in a, in a more liberal and just way. And that's why they, they treated Commonwealth citizens as, as a as British citizens, although, of course, the Indians had no intention whatever of, of remaining in, in, in the British sphere, <laughs> sphere of influence. Um, so stupidity is an important factor in human affairs and, and, and certainly in political debate. Uh, in the US, uh, as Richard again mentioned, uh, uh, <laughs> he's not just uh, uh, reduced the libertarian quota, but he's also <laughs> said a lot of things I was going to say. 
the, uh, the government triggered mass immigration in 65. As I say, uh, uh, amid the firmest predictions that it was going to make no difference. In fact, when Johnson signed the act, which he did at the foot of the Statue of Liberty in, in 65, he said, this, w this is not a major and important act. It will make no significant difference to the United States. Uh, he couldn't, couldn't be more wrong. Um, and it's important to realize, by the way, that, you know, uh, th the Im immigrant inflow that came into the U.S. at that point was, uh, was after a lull of more than 40 years when there had been essentially no immigration at all. Uh, after the cutoffs, cutoffs of the 1920s. It's quite wrong to imagine that the US is a nation of immigrants, although that is the, the much promoted uh, national myth. I mean, if you think about it, all nations are nations of immigrants. There's no known case where people grew out of the ground. The only issue is the speed with, with which the immigration occurred uh, and, uh, and the effectiveness of, uh, of the assimilation process. The US was put together much faster than, than, than uh, uh, the historic nations of Europe. The problem is it can be unput together again t uh, equally quickly, and I think that's actually what's going to happen. Uh, however, for most of its history, the, U the U.S. basically grew through natural increase. Uh, its population would have been about half uh, of what it, is n uh, what it is now. That is, it would have been bigger than Japan, bigger than Germany. If there had been no immigration at all after the American Revolution, um, uh, the, the, the nation that de Tocqueville described in Democracy in America in the 1840s was still the same, the same as it had been in 1790. It was, it was overwhelmingly Protestant and British. The part of England, of, of the US that Lydia and I live in, uh, New England, there'd been no immigration at all for 200 years since the great migrations of the early 17th century. These people, they'd grown entirely by natural increase. Uh, the, the, they were Puritans, but they multiplied like rabbits one of the highest po known recorded pop uh, population growth rates. Um, as we say in America, go figure. Uh, and that's why the arrival of the Catholic Irish, like Lydia's ancestors, was such a shock. They had no, it was complete shock. They had no experience of immigration at all and no, no memory of it. Uh, it's also wrong to imagine that, the, uh, although this is the national myth also, the Americans just thought about it and accepted uh, Irish immigration. Uh, what happened was that Irish immigration basically stopped after the, 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 the influx triggered by the 1848 potato famine. Essentially, the world uh, just ran out of Irish at that point. Uh, <laughs> I, I say this with regret. I've had two Irish wives. <laughs> Not simultaneously, of course. Uh, and that's just one of many such pauses in American history. Uh, and those pauses, uh, and they're stretching right back to the colonial period. Uh, those pauses have been essential uh, to the process of assimilation. You know, one of the things you always hear from immigration enthusiasts, and the, uh, immigration is an, uh, an area where you get moral enthusiasm, particularly among American intellectuals, is that, well, Ben Franklin said the same about the Germans. He said, and this is true, he did, in the mid in this middle of the 18th century, the question is whether they will Germanize, whether we will Anglify them, because in those days they referred themselves as, British, as English. The Americans, or whether uh, they will Germanize us. And people say, well, she, look, uh, Franklin was wrong. But that, uh, he was right. What happened was uh, the Seven Years' War happened and, and, and the great flow of what, was, what the Americans call the French and Indian War. Uh, and the great flow of German immigration stopped. And it didn't resume again until uh, the, the late 1840s. And those pauses were essential to the process of, of assimilation. Now, but the, the, the issue is that now is that because of the demographic structure of the Third World, uh, there's no such pause on the horizon uh, for the U.S. or the U.K. or indeed the First World. Now, Richard has already pointed out that a as a result of this uh, uh, act in the U.S., in the, US uh, the white population in the U.S. is going to go into a minority somewhere around 2040. In fact, a majority of births were um, uh, in the U.S. For the first time, majority of births in 2012 were non-white. That didn't include our youngest daughter, Caria, uh, uh, who, but the, the, who was born in 2012. I'm doing my best to reverse this statistic <laughs> trend. Um, she's named, by the way, after the uh, Hans and Gulchin Hoppe's um, uh, Kari Princess of Tower, where the, the, the uh, Property and Freedom Society conferences are held. It's um, in Bodrum. It's our, our tribute to them. Um, anyway, this is a. Um, this is a population that was 90% white 
in 1960. Then it will go into a minority, uh, uh, and the mice will go into a minority by 2040 when Kai will be um, barely 30. Um, uh, even more amazingly, of course, and this is a comment on the sheer recklessness of, uh, of immigration policy, the same is happening here, as Richard, as Richard points out, it'll be, about, it'll be about 20 years later. Now, this is a country, the UK, where DNA archaeology has established uh, that the great bulk of the population has actually been here since the last ice age. Um, maybe maybe seventy uh, uh, percent in, in terms of the population stock can be traced back to the to, to fourteen thousand years. Uh, DNA archaeology uh, has actually re completely rewritten uh, British historiography. As you know, you know it's not true that the English are the descendants of Saxon invaders, except linguistically. Uh, the base population just simply changed its um, changed its language, uh, and it's not even true that there's any. Um, uh, uh, ethnic difference, real, real difference between the Irish and the English. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I say this with, with apologies to the Irishman here. The point is, 14,000 years of history are about to be overwritten by just a few decades uh, of government policy. Uh, and the, the real blow was struck uh, in the uh, during the Blair government. Uh, that's when they, 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 um, they, opened, they really opened up the borders in, in a variety of ways through asylum policy and basically through administrative processes. And, uh, 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 and uh, you know, a couple of years ago, one of the speech, Blair's speechwriters, Andrew Neither, actually gave a speech, actually gave, wrote a column which he said, quite, it just shows you what world these people live in, they don't expect any criticism, that the reason they did it is that they wanted to uh, make Britain multicultural and to, to rub the nose of the right in multiculturalism. In other words, they're openly uh, uh, deciding to, to remake the population because they don't like the one they've got already. It's treason, of course. The, the usual debate and the usual uh, thing that we get that gets thrown at us if we're critical of immigration is that this is racism. But what's actually been done by these governments is treason. Well, why does it matter, though, uh, from a libertarian point of view? Uh, I, I, I think the conservative position, and I would say the pale libertarian tradition, is that it's not really up to us to say why it matters. It's up to the people uh, on the other side, the people who are doing this to explain why they want to do it. Um, one reason that, that, that they can't, one argument that they can't use is, uh, is uh, economics. When I started writing uh, my alienation uh, in the early 90s, I was astonished to find that the, the consensus, the consensus among academic economists was that immigration was of, was of no significant benefit to the native born. Uh, it, it, uh, it may increase GDP, uh, but all of that is, ca essentially all of that is captured by the, uh, by the immigrants themselves. Uh, the the uh, benefits to the native born are, are simply insignificant, and that's true in whichever way you looked at it, fiscally uh, or in terms of income and so on. Uh, essentially, these countries are transforming themselves uh, for nothing. There's something actually even more puzzling about the uh, technical economic debate, uh, which I, I say that, that result is replicated right across the world. Every developed economy where, where this has been studied, we find that the economic benefits of immigration are nugatory. But what it, what the, and that's widely known. But what doesn't seem to be widely known, even among economists, is that although uh, um, the economic benefits and uh, the economic impact is, is, is uh, are in ba on balance nugatory. It does cause an immense redistribution of income between the native born. In the US, it's estimated, because of its, its marginal impact on wages, uh, in, in the US, it's, it's, it's estimated that about 2% of GDP is being transferred uh, from labor to capital. Uh, and this, this explains, I think, uh, that's a big number. I mean, $16 trillion economy is like $3 billion. So it's, it's a very substantial number. And it explains the ferocity of the current debate in the US, where businesses are pu pu pouring money into trying to push through a, a bill which will uh, uh, not simply amnesty the 11 to 20 million people who are, who are in the US illegally. We don't know how many there are. Uh, but it's also going to double or triple legal immigration. Um, that's enormous windfall profit to the owners of capital, people like Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, what we're looking at is, is, is a looting of the American economy through this process. 
uh, very similar in a way to uh, the looting of the Soviet economy, that the so Russian economy that took place um, when the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, it's aimed at income rather than assets, but it's still a, a serious looting, they're just changing the terms of trade. So uh, the immigration debate really in some ways is a posthumous vindication of Karl Marx. Uh, it, it, it can be explained in class terms. Uh, and the people who are opposed to immigration tend to be, uh, the people who most suffer from it are the, are the, uh, are the working class. Uh, but who cares about them? That's what it comes down to. Certainly not the Labour Party in, in Britain or the Liberals in the, in the, in the, in the US. So, so what's going on here is rent seeking, uh, technically not rent seeking by the owners of capital. And obviously no libertarian, libertarian could support that. More broadly, of course, uh, and Hans Hoppe has written a great deal about this, is, is what, what he calls forced integration. The host populations oppose this social engineering transformation. It's universal the project uh, uh, of, of uh, government elites. Um, I, I commend to you all, uh, of course, a speech I gave uh, at the Poverty and Freedom Society a few years ago which I called, uh, titled Immigration the Viagra of the State, uh, uh, adapting Randall Bourne's famous uh, uh, comment that war is the health of the state. Essentially, non-traditional immigration has immensely empowered uh, the new class, the group that lives off tax revenues and, and uh, uh, pushes everybody else around. Uh, it's given a new excuse to intervene in, so in society. Uh, Sean Gabb told us yesterday that after uh, a thousand years, the British have given up double jeopardy. Uh, but he, uh, w w the subtext of that is that it, this happened because of a, 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 a white-on-black killing of, of a guy called Stephen Lawrence, which has become a major uh, uh, sort of religious event here. He's endlessly celebrated and incredibly. His mother, I believe, is now in the House of Lords, isn't she? See, Stephen Lawrence's mother. Um, because this guy, uh, because of the, ri the, 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 the fact that it's a white and black killing, of course, all kinds of black and white killings going on all the time, but that doesn't attract attention. That, uh, that get emboldened the, uh, the uh, British elites uh, to overthrow this uh, 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 trampling of their power, the, uh, the, du the double jeopardy law. And uh, similarly, um, the uh, uh, whole things like freedom of speech and so on are really under pressure in Britain because of this perceived need or the alleged need to, um, to placate an, an, uh, the um, uh, uh, imported minorities. I said that we don't know uh, what's going to happen next. And on the, the way over, uh, flying over from New York, um, I picked up this book, which is really quite an amazing thing. It's by an economist called Paul Collier. Does anybody know this guy? He's at Oxford. He's very well known, big liberal economist. And it's caused kind of a stir in the, uh, in the, in the uh, what we call immigration patriot movement to, uh, because it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's reached radical restrictive conclusions on a global basis. It argues that uh, migration is... Uh, uh, is damaging the, uh, the, what everybody concerned, and that it, it, unless something is done about it, uh, it's going to lead to global crisis. Now, he's done this in a really interesting way. You can't tell from looking at the book that it says this. It looks like a standard rah rah immigration book. And if you read it, you find there's all kinds of hostages to fortune in there. Uh, for example, there's, there's a, a violent denunciation of Enoch Powell. He blamed Enoch Powell for uh, his, his famous 68 speech, for making it impossible to discuss immigration for 40 years. Um, and that may be true among the elites, but it also meant, by the way, that they, they didn't, uh, it took 40 years for them to summon up courage to increase immigration dramatically, as, when, uh, as Blair did when he got into power. Uh, it, and he also says flat out that there's no, there's no uh, uh, differences between races. Uh, 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 <laughs> Richard doesn't agree with him. Uh, and, but he says this, of course, because he's, um, uh, he wants to remain, apparently, remain in uh, the good graces of Amer Britain's uh, liberal establishment. But he wants to, to bring this point across, uh, that, um, that immigration is damaging. Uh, uh, to the, uh, to the economy, and again, he repeats what I've just said, that uh, you know, the amazing thing is there's no evidence it benefits anybody particularly. Uh, it's just accept the immigrants. One of the arguments he makes, and it's an argument which I've made myself when trying to reason with, with libertarians, is that there's a cultural prerequisites for capitalism or for any kind of uh, free market. I call it the metal market. 
He calls it, a, uh, he draw, draws on Robert Putnam's subsequent work and says it's a question of trust. If people don't trust each other, it becomes much more difficult to, op to operate free markets. Um, he, uh, he points out that cultures immigrate. If, if people come, they bring the, their cultures and ideas with him. And he's a development economist, so he has some hilarious stories about Africa. He says, for example, that in Nigeria, uh, there's no, you can't buy life insurance because uh, the Nigerians have, dis uh, have discovered that they can collect on life insurance without the inconvenience of actually dying uh, by simply bribing doctors to give them death certificates. And this is so prevalent and widespread in Nigeria that the, the life insurance companies have simply withdrawn. <laughs> now, what happens when these people come here? Well, the answer is they send you email saying that they've got a bank account, and if you <laughs> send me your bank account, uh, uh, you know, they run these e the emails to get scams. Now, long and bitter experience in the immigration debate, I've been working it, writing for more than 20 years in the US on it, uh, teaches me that there's no such thing as a breakthrough, you know, never any breakthroughs. Um, uh, because the vested interest is still, still, still st st are really so strong. But there's no doubt this is, this is a really interesting development, and, and we'll see if it actually is the breakthrough that we, we all keep expecting. If that doesn't happen, um, I will conclude another poem, which I address to Americans and, and the UK in general, and, and also to uh, any left libertarians who may be in the room, uh, to think about what's going to happen to them in the future. Uh, we have at least one, one Etonian in the room, don't we? Is, is that, uh, any other old Etonians? Right. Well, Gray, as you know, wrote this wonderful poem, an uh, ode on the pros distant prospect of Eton College uh, in the 18th century. And it contained the famous lines, Alas, regardless of their doom, the little victims play. And that's actually what's happening here. Uh, everybody's, uh, we're all playing, the public debate is all playing on, on, on trivia. Whereas, in fact, this, uh, and the, this great doom is bearing down on us, on us unless we do something about it. Thank you very much. So, questions? Um, I, will, I will then. Yep. Uh, just with regards, at the start of your talk, you uh, mentioned that Fertility rates were not very well understood that they seemed to go in cyclical patterns. Mm -hmm. Just in the, in the 20th century, well, I, I know the trend myself that uh, essentially when abortion and contraception are legal in countries, birth rates are very high. Like you can see it in, in most of the Catholic countries, that they had very high birth rates whilst it, uh, abortion and contraception were legal. And then, for example, in Spain under Franco, it was legal. And then once Franco uh, died, democracy came in, they legalized abortion, and the birth rate just collapsed like off a cliff. Um, also, in, 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 you would have noticed in England when the Anglican Church and no longer considered contraception to be a sin at the Lambeth Conference in 1930. Do you not think, uh, like, in, and in ancient Rome, there was abortion practices as well, which would have, would have uh, become more popular amongst the elites towards the end of the empire. Do you not think that these might be trends where, which could be considered, given that we're talking about the declining fertility of, of Western countries, that these, this is like the, the key, one of the key factors in the whole situation? You mean if we were to ban uh, contraception and abortion again, uh, uh, the birth rates might go up? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a paradox about abortion in the, in the US, uh, which is that um, Catholics tend to have a higher abortion rate than, uh, than Protestants do. Uh, and and uh, apparently it's because they don't want to face the shame of having leg legitimate children, whereas the Protestants uh, apparently doesn't bother. It doesn't bother as much. I would say myself that the two things the, those are symptoms rather than causes. I mean the the, the collapse of the birth rate in the, in the Catholic countries across the world is it's a worldwide phenomenon and and and. Uh, uh, it's something that has to be, uh, I, I don't think it's understood at all. I don't know that uh, ch changing, uh, changing that kind of law would make a difference. I think it, 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 was, it was the society as a whole, uh, something in the society as a, as a whole that changed, uh, that paralleled, paralleled those changes. Um, we were just discussing in the break, you know, I, I think a major issue with uh, with birth rates is that it's quite rare for, uh, for young women, for teenage girls, to see babies. Uh, certainly when uh, my first wife had, uh, had, and I had our, our son, 
uh, 22 years ago. Neither of us had the least experience of babies. We didn't know one end of a baby from another, you know. Which is just, whereas, whereas my own uh, daughter that I had with my first wife, uh, she, she was around a teenager when, um, when our two daughters, my Lydia and my daughters, were born. And it completely changed her life. She, uh, she has announced that she no longer wants to be a forensic psychiatrist. She basically wants to get married and have children as soon as she gets out of college. Uh, and and um, she said, she told Lydia, she doesn't talk to me about this stuff, of course, but she's told Lydia that, well, uh, she hears all the girlfriends at high school talking about what they're going to do and all that, and she's sitting there thinking, uh, when are they going to have children? Uh, she doesn't say that, of course, because women aren't confrontational, by and large, some, some notable exceptions. Uh, uh, but she, but uh, in other words, just having the baby, I, I think it's, it's almost like a, the cycle could go into reverse. If more, if more young girls see babies, I think they get more intrigued by them. But we just don't know. Why did it go up after the war? So strong in right, acro right across uh, all the country. We just don't know what moves country, what moves. Uh, I'm fascinated by this, this phenomenon of mommy blogs in the U.S. Does, any, does anybody know about this? Mommy blogs. There are all these w y y women who are married who blog about bringing up children. And, and there's a whole uh, network of them. And uh, uh, can you give me a name? I mean, they're endless. They're you can apply to Lydia if you want the names. <laughs> but, but, I mean, that's created a real supportive community for, for young women with, with children at home. And, and uh, you know, that may, it may well have an, an impact. But it's, it's, a, it's a real phenomenon that's substantial in the U.S. And, of course, totally under the, ma under the mainstream media's radar. That, that the mainstream media's not doing anything to support this. People just do it all by themselves. Do you have any more questions? <coughs> I want. Um, you, would you agree that the... You know, the, the enemy is, is not uh, the immigrants coming in. The enemy is, uh, is within. You know, people like, like John F. Kennedy and, and Clement Attlee and Tony Blair and uh, Obama. You know, somehow we, we need to, you know, find the way out of this, uh, you know, straitjacket that, uh, you know, liberal democracy uh, is. And, and the question is, is how? And even if we you know, stop non-European immigration, in America now, uh, <coughs> Europeans, uh, people of European uh, descent in America would still become uh, a min minority. Would only kind of uh, delay uh, the process, and we would, uh, you know, well, even that's, that's make make things easier for the the li liberal Democrats to uh, stay longer in uh, in power. Uh, I don't think that would actually, that, that the U.S. the U.S. device would go into a minority because it's pushed off so long that, for all we know, fertility rates among the immigrants are going to fall uh, as well. So it, it, it will be pushed off. Like the current calculation is it will be pushed off nearly 100 years. So who knows what's going to happen? In general, to be admitted into any kind of public debate in the U.S., you've got to say nice things about immigrants. So that's the kind of thing we always say. Well, you know, it's not their fault; it's our fault, and that's kind. Of I'm not. I'm kind of bored with this because it strikes me it is their fault to a large extent. I mean, why are they camping in the on the capital uh, outside the capital and fasting and demanding that illegal immigrants be admitted? You know. Uh, the American legal immigrants are not in the shadows, as they always say. They've got, they're having demonstrations and demanding that all kinds of things be given to them, including citizenship. So, I mean, uh, it seems to me that the behavior is outrageous. So, it's, but, but in general, of course, you're right. I mean, the big, the, the big problem is, 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 the, is the left. Uh, and, and not just the left, but also, frankly, libertarians and, and, and the business class. And they're, they're driving the U.S. towards a gated Brazil, and they know the big gated communities and, and, uh, and chaos. It will ultimately break up, I think. That's the bright thing, is secession. I mean, it's going, to, it's going to exacerbate the secession movements in the U.S. Because these communities are going to have, the various parts of the U.S. are going to have nothing in common with each other. They're not going to speak the same language. They're not going to have the, the same, um, there's going to be no longer enforce uh, the, the la language requirement on citizenship. It's technically, you're supposed to be speaking this to become a citizen. But when I became a a city, U.S. citizen. The, the first woman, the first woman directly in front of me, couldn't understand the judge. <laughs> she, had, she had to swear the oath, but she couldn't understand the judge. And and uh, he he swore in anyway. They, they just had an interpreter do it. So all that, all that kind of thing has collapsed. So so you know, it's, it, uh, the U.S. Is, uh, is on the course to breaking up, and that's probably a good thing because we'll, uh, as someone said earlier, that we'll see people set up separate communities in which uh, um, maybe uh, the original Americans will will we'll be able to rule themselves again. Uh, as an alternative to a 
fascist dictatorship to solve this problem. Um, <coughs> I beg your pardon? An alternative to, to, to a fascist dictatorship to solve the problem of um, especially dysgenics, I suppose. What do you think about changing the nature of how families live together, for example, from a nuclear family to having multi-generations in multiple generations under the same roof? Um, to a certain extent, that is happening in the US. I mean, you get these blended families uh, which are quite complicated. Uh, I don't know how you would uh, enforce it by public policy. Uh, I don't think, I mean, there is, no, there is a more libertarian way of getting at what Richie wants to do, which is basically to allow, allow people to freedom of association again. And, and if that happens, as I say, I think they will secede and form their own communities and, and uh, gradually co correct, themselves, correct this problem among, them, among themselves. Um, uh, but I wasn't in the army, and Richard was, so maybe I should think about this. In a, I haven't been educated in the use of force. <laughs> How are we doing? Brilliant, thanks very much. Well, uh, okay, perhaps uh, one more uh, question. But isn't it you know, a, a much deeper uh, ideological uh, problem? You know, for example, in my home country, in, in Iceland, you know, we are pretty much, uh, you know, uh, all the all the same. We, we don't have any problems with with immigrants uh, at all. Uh, that is because we are no one, one of the most kind of uh, <laughs> <laughs> one of the most uh, you know politically correct countries in yes. the uh, you know in the world. You know we buy into all that, and uh, as uh, Sebastian would put it, you know cultural Protestantism gone wild. You know political correctness gone wild, and you know I would um, agree with uh, uh, with Sean Gap yesterday that the heart of the beast. Is the United States and is uh, Washington D.C. You know, we get it from from there. You know, you kind of set the uh, the rule. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, while for example in, in Denmark, you know, they are experiencing uh, great uh, problems. And they're really uh, awakening. You know, it's a totally different uh, situation. So, um, is it partly a a good thing that? Uh, you know, uh, that immigration, mass immigration, is causing people um, to to awake and see kind of see things in a in a in a, in a different way. You know, <laughs> it strikes me as kind of a drastic remedy. You know, <laughs> uh, it sounds like building down the house to get rid of rats. Uh, uh, but it is true that you see, you do find intense political correctness in in, in uh, overwhelmingly white societies. Um, and, uh, and, and it's also true that uh, a lot of this comes from the US and the American conservatives in general and the, and the pale conservatives in particular are acutely aware of this. It's so uh, advanced that uh, uh, it's not uncommon to find them uh, disassociating. No, they're no longer, particularly younger p people, I have young men writing for me who don't regard themselves as, as patriotic Americans. Uh, 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 the problem, the thing about a, a society like Iceland, though, is you can always change. Uh, the problem with diverse society, and diversity is not strength, it's weakness. And one of the forms of weakness is uh, political debate, debate becomes much more fraught. It's much more difficult to take certain positions if, if people are divided on ethnic lines and always looking for ethnic grievances. I think you could pull out of it in, in, uh, in Iceland. It's very difficult to do that in the U.S. Uh, uh, and that's why I think in ultimately the U.S. will, will, uh, will, will break up, uh, I'm sorry to say. Uh, I mean, I regret it, but it's, it's, uh, it's a result of bad policy and it's going to be difficult to unwind. Thank you. Our last speaker is uh, Jan Lester. He's a philosopher specializing in libertarianism. Apart from uh, articles, dialogues, and book chapters, uh, many available online, he's the author of Escape the Leviathan, Libertarianism Without Justificationism, which was published in paperback last year 
and Arguments for Liberty, which was published in 2011. The title of the talk is Intellectual Property, Non-Aggressive Meme Proprietarianism. Please welcome Jan, Jan Lester. <coughs> Thank you. Actually, Jan is a Cornish name, uh, the only place in the world where there are male Jans. Uh, I'm going to have to talk briefly about liberty uh, because all this thing is premised on my theory of liberty and without that as a background it won't make sense. A lot of people who call themselves libertarians, from my point of view, aren't really libertarians. They're uh, self-ownership areas or private propertarians, but they don't do everything in terms of liberty first and foremost, and for me this is a big problem. Uh, we need some sort of Copernican revolution which puts liberty at the centre and then explains everything else rather than assumes private property and then tries to talk about liberty. Um, this should come out fairly quickly. Liberty. Uh, <coughs> I shall be reading because as Karl Popper used to say, uh, what I write is cleverer than I am. <laughs> liberty is most broadly understood as some absence of constraints. Libertarians are interested in social or interpersonal liberty. People not being constrained by each other in the sense of proactively imposing or, if you like, aggressing. Without such proactive constraints, it follows that people will immediately control, i.e., in effect, own, in a de facto sense, themselves and any external goods they come to acquire without proactively imposing. Thus people have liberty to the extent that they are not proactively interfered with in their bodies or external property. Various problems and paradoxes can be posed. For instance, can someone secretly buy all the land around you and then not let you out? Can light waves <laughs> from a few uh, electric lights on one's own property trespass onto others' property without their permission. Such problems can be solved by reverting to the more abstract pre propertarian theory of liberty. Where clashes of proactive imposition are inevitable among some people, the libertarian policy is to follow whichever rule will minimise such impositions. So generally, a right of access to one's land and a right to have some lights without a blackout are the lesser impositions than their opposites. What libertarians usually say, so I apologise for keep mentioning liberty and libertarians after I was told not to, but um, <laughs> it is what I write about. Uh, what libertarians usually say about some other ideological conceptions of liberty is that they are not about interpersonal liberty at all, but rather about power, ability, opportunity, self-realisation, or any other, number of, uh, any number of other distinct things. However, it would be foolish to argue about the mere use of words, and so if people want to define liberty in some other way, then let them. But the libertarian is advocating liberty only in, more or less, the sense explained. Why should people have liberty? It is a conjecture that this is desirable. It is better to criticise the conjecture in the critical rationalist manner than to ask for supporting reasons. <coughs> but it ought to be understood that libertarians typically also suppose that there is no systematic clash with human welfare. One can, of course, explain how libertarians think liberty will operate, and such explanations abound. But an explanation is not a justification, and it is itself conjectural. Most libertarians are benighted justificationists, like most people, and so they attempt to offer epistemological support for libertarianism uh, by reference to a prioriist Austrian economics, autonomy, contractarianism, natural rights, utilitarianism, uh, eudaimonism, or whatever happens to be the latest justificationist fashion. So that's approximately the theory of liberty and how it relates to property. Now, intellectual property is a bit different. To avoid possible confusion, please note that this is not a discussion of what any state law on intellectual property actually says or does. 
It is about the application of a libertarian theory to the concept of intellectual property. It is sometimes asserted that people only ever own and can conceivably can only ever own specific rights of use concerning the expression of an idea rather than own the intellectual object itself. However, one could equally well assert something analogous and more obviously erroneous of a physical object. People only ever own and conceivably can only ever own specific rights of use concerning a physical object rather than the physical object itself. But to own the rights of use just is to own the physical object itself. And therefore, to the extent that there is the protected use and control of an intellectual object by someone, there seems no reason to suppose, sorry, no reason to deny that this is owning that intellectual object, or, as I shall occasionally say, partly for brevity, meme. Some memes might be independently discovered or created. Most patented, patented ideas, uh, usually someone else would have come up with them eventually. Some are not. Most copyrighted works. No one would have written the same novels if Charles Dickens had not done so. This distinction matters because anyone's intellectual property that is allowed to extend beyond likely independent discovery or creation is thereby likely to proactively impose on other people. Conversely, that others are not worse off than if some example of intellectual property had never been created appears to show that it does not proactively impose inherently, or at least one person would always be worse off as a result of the intellectual property. If it were somehow naturally impossible to use an idea without its creator's permission, then people would be unlikely to complain that they were proactively imposed on by this, as they would see that they were not. Thus, one defence of intellectual property is that it is libertarian to allow it and unlibertarian to disallow it up until any likely independent production would emerge, if it ever would. It would be shared with any who could demonstrate that they probably would have eventually become independent creators of it or with everybody if it eventually by a certain time would likely have become invented or discovered anyway. When all claims run out, it becomes common property by entering the public domain. Some kind of impartial decision or arbitration process, taking account of the pace at which relevant memes are produced, might therefore be needed to determine the likely time limit in each case. It would also need to decide how dissimilar from a particular idea would still count as using that idea and decide on some conception of fair usage. For instance, would discussing, parodying or satirising it count? And how does this affect gifts, sale, rental or loans that were not authorised by the original IP holder? Intellectual property is controversial among libertarians. Many are sceptical or critical, including for some of the following significant, but not exhaustive or collectively consistent reasons. One, it is a state monopoly and widely abused. Two, it prevents people from doing what they like with their own physical property. Three, if you don't want people to know about your ideas, then you can simply keep them secret, as happens with some ingredients for commercial food and drink products, for instance. Four, ideas are not finite as the physical world is, so intellectual property does not help to deal with the problem of scarcity as, a physical, pro as physical property does, but actually creates an artificial scarcity. Five, a sufficient amount of intellectual production can be stimulated simply by the profitability of being the first to market. Six, contracts with purchasers, not to copy, etc., can produce sufficient protection to make intellectual production profitable. Seven, technological devices can legitimately help to prevent copying 
And taking the particular libertarian theory outlined above, we might also uh, uh, add the following two points. Eight, suppose someone sells a product uh, in a new geographical area or markets a product in a new way. Then it seems that the innovator could claim a form of intellectual property not to be copied in that way that would thereby interfere with the normal and apparently libertarian and efficient parts of market competition. And finally, nine, I paint my house blue and you want to copy me. Should I be allowed to forbid this or charge you? Could it be libertarian or efficient to have ownership of such trivial ideas? Taking these nine criticisms in order, libertarian intellectual property might be defended along the following lines. One, there is no necessity for the state to be the organisation that enforces intellectual property. And the fact that state intellectual property has often been abused does not reflect badly on private enforcement. Intellectual property is only a monopoly in the, sense, in the same sense as owning any single physical thing. I'll come back to this in a minute. Two, you cannot do what you like with your own property when it interferes with the property of others. It merely denies the thesis without an argument to assert that you are doing nothing with anyone else's property by copying someone's book, uh, thereby using his ideas and selling your own physical versions. If intellectual property is libertarian, then you are using his intellectual property as though it were your own. Three, keeping ideas secret often means not using them. In such cases, advising secrecy is analogous with saying, if you don't want people to steal from your stall, then don't take your produce to market. Four, each idea is a single thing in the mimetic realm, what Karl Popper calls world three, and thus is scarce. Examples or uses of the idea in other minds, world two, or the physical world, world one, are not the idea itself. If you can use my idea as you wish when I would rather own it, then I am proactively imposed on just as much as if you used my physical property against my wishes. I might not know that you have used my intellectual property or that I have suffered a financial loss, but that is also true of any physical property of mine. In both cases, there is an objective trespass involving another's particular resource. It might still be objected that I am free to use the idea as much as I, am, as much as I like, and so I am not constrained in any way but I am not free to use the idea in the sense of deciding what is done with it. Admittedly, there is no scarcity with the use of good ideas, unless we allow restrictions by using such things as secrecy, purchaser contracts, technological devices, or, I, or intellectual property. But there is a scarcity of good ideas themselves. And all the restrictions tackle that scarcity without worsening anyone's ex-ante situation by rewarding the creation of good ideas. Five, physical property internalises externalities to a considerable extent and strongly tends thereby to be optimally economic and libertarian. The same seems to be true of intellectual property. To expect an in inventor of an idea to have sufficient incentive merely by being first to market is significantly like expecting the creator of a physical product, product to sell what he can before people discover where his factory is or farm is and then simply loot it without his consent. And even where it is still profitable, it will often be insufficiently profitable to stimulate an economic amount of production setting aside the practical and theoretical problems of estimating this and comparing different systems for efficiency. Six, if every relevant product is sold subject to contract that no user can copy it without permission, 
then that would stop copying using the ideas by all customers. But what if a non-customer can see or find out how something works or what it looks like? We can have no such contract with the mere observer. With certain memes, this could undermine all or most of the economic incentive to produce it. And, as before, even where it is still profitable, it might not be opt optimally economic. To expect the creator of an idea to protect his idea by contract is like expecting the homesteader of some land to protect his land by contract with every other person. 7. Technological devices that restrict using others' ideas at expense. If they could somehow be made perfect for all products, then we would simply be back to a situation analogous with the natural impossibility of using others' ideas, but with all the added expense. If such anti-copying devices are in principle fine, without limit, then why not simply allow the cheaper option of having intellectual property in the first place? 8. It is not clear that starting a new market practice should not be protected uh, if protection is claimed, subject to like the independent invention. Counterintuitive though this may be, this would appear to internalise externalities and thus would tend to be, I, I would argue, libertarian and efficient. 9. Any intellectual property ownership needs to be claimed and it cannot clash with any existing contracts, such as what and how house colours are allowed on, say, some privately run estate. It is not likely that many people would want to claim what is trivial, but such things are, after all, only trivial. In any case, we still have the limit of likely independent event invention. Somebody would have thought of painting their house view blue eventually. In short, Intellectual property is an extension of property into the mimetic realm for relevantly and sufficiently similar economic reasons rather than perfect analogies. As to why it is libertarian and economic in the physical realm. It must have appeared strange when people first attempted to fence off land and claim exclusive rights of use. They had not, after all, even created the land. But those who claim IP have at least created it, albeit in the framework of a pre-existing culture. To reject intellectual property is to be in favour of compulsory communism in the realm of ideas. Admittedly, however, this could not be anywhere near as disastrous as compulsory communism in the physical realm. Of course, this libertarian defence of intellectual property may well be mistaken. Uh, but it appears to give reasonably cogent answers to the listed current criticisms of intellectual property as far as I can see. It ought at least to clarify and develop the debate to attempt to refute it. All that being said, patents, copyrights and trademarks are the most notable forms of intellectual property recognised in the world today. So how far are they congruent with the outline theory. They approximate to varying degrees in various different cases. Thus in some cases they are significantly better than nothing from libertarian and welfare perspectives and in other cases they are significantly worse. But if the theory provided here is substantially correct uh, then even within a statist framework they can be ameliorated. However, this could not hope to match an anarcho-libertarian framework. And in either case, I hereby claim intellectual property in this theory of intellectual property. Thank you.
quote from a lecture earlier this year by Jen Lester entitled The Intellectual Property is Not Interested in Improprietarianism. Uh, I don't have uh, any uh, permission from, from the author, but uh, I will quote that there is a scarcity of good ideas. Uh, yes. I didn't claim uh, intellectual property in this particular talk, of course. Uh, yes, there's a scarcity of good ideas. What, what, what point are you making? Oh, no. I, I just wanted to quote you. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Do that as often as you like. <laughs> um, I was hoping you might be able to respond to one of my favourite arguments against intellectual property, which is that... Um, if, if, our, if our end practical goals are to encourage the generation, the sharing and the application of ideas for the betterment of humanity as a whole, <coughs> I think you could make some fairly strong arguments that the latter two are not helped by intellectual property and that it's a sort of a mixed bag on the first. Um, and I was wondering if you could perhaps respond to that general point of view. In the short run, it, it might look like it would be better if there wasn't any property and everybody has free access, but you're undermining the incentive effect of allowing people to keep the fruits of their labour. And it's a very important part of this particular theory that uh, you can only have as much as you actually created. So, uh, like, if uh, you, you beat somebody to the patent office you know, uh, by a little bit, you, uh, say by a week or two in all likelihood, you only get exclusive right up for that first week or two and then the other guy gets it and then somebody else and so on and eventually it would become uh, common property because uh, somebody would have come up with it. Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of an obvious thing and everybody was working on this problem. So just to give you some incentive to have gone about it, you just get as much as some sort of independent uh, judicial procedure or arbitration procedure decides is reasonable and no more. You have the incentive to produce it and then after that it's everybody's. Uh, for me that's just that process of internalising um, the externalities, the, in this case the beneficial externalities uh, uh, insofar as you're responsible for them, just is uh, libertarian and efficient. I can't see there's any problem with... I mean, the idea, you know, you say to somebody who, like, who writes a book, Harry Potter and whatever, escapes from Leviathan, uh, the second that it comes out, somebody can just take it and make copies and, I mean, what's, that must undermine the process of uh, uh, encouraging people to write such books. And uh, What's your loss if somebody creates something, even if there's perpetual copyright in something like a book, which there might or might not be. If, some, if something, if a book uh, could drop out of copyright in the sense that the, um, we don't know anybody who inherited it and it's been out of print for a long time, in which case, arguably, either it's become part of the public domain <coughs> or it could belong to whoever first republishes it, gets some sort of a claim. I'm not too positive on that, but it would all have to be worked out in terms of the extent to which they were sort of adding value rather than simply being a nuisance to other people. So I just don't see any inefficiency inherently in intellectual property. I just, I certainly think there are lots of bad intellectual property in the same way that there are, I mean, you can't look at the average corporation and say, there you are, that's what, uh, private property anarchy gets you because the whole thing is riddled through with state legislation and corruption. Intellectual property at the moment is riddled through with state legislation and corruption. So this is, a, this is a, I think, a completely different <coughs> approach, I hope. Yeah, yeah I think the, uh, isn't, it, isn't it about sort of scarcity, surely? I know, I know that's the point, as you've said, but it, to me it's sort of enforcement of law on property. You know, you have like Butler Schaefer and Boundaries of Order, if you read it. He wrote that property must have boundaries, you must have claim to it, and you have control of it. You can't really apply that to intellectual property. And I understand that, I'm just saying that how can you 
Sure, it's a, it's a matter of morality and social grace as to not, you know, rob you of your, you know, to steal your work and then claim it as my own. To enforce that as property, I mean, it's, I suppose it's about the definition of property, but scarcity for me is the key. Well, an idea is a particular individual thing. In that sense, it is scarce. Uh, there's only one Pythagoras' theorem. And, and it has very definite boundaries, such that you can come up with something that's so different, you say, well, that's no longer Pythagoras' theorem, that's something else. So it doesn't, no, it doesn't even say anything about triangles. So uh, the scarcity is there. I don't see any problem with boundaries, but we're talking about intellectual boundaries rather than uh, physical boundaries. But that, uh, intellectual boundaries seem to me to be quite coherent. Anything which is sufficiently similar to the original object is using that object without its creator's permission and thereby um, not respecting the property rights of the creator. Yeah, I can see that. I just think it's, it's a matter of boundaries in terms of um, the enforcement of it. Because, you know, at what stage when you're copying Mozart or something, you know, how the Beatles copy Beethoven, um, at what stage does it become plagiarism, you know, or whatever you like to call it? Uh, 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 yeah, of course there'll be difficulties, but then there's difficulties with private property. Uh, but you don't say... But there are boundaries there. Uh, yeah, there are boundaries with private property. There are boundaries with um, intellectual property as well. Uh, and what you'd have to have is uh, a system where, you know, arbitration by experts, you know, with appeals, with evidence. Uh, obviously, if there's money involved, there's going to be more thrown at it in order to make these boundaries precise. But in principle, I can't see why somebody couldn't say this tune is sufficiently like that tune that we, everybody knows that basically it's a rip-off. And um, maybe there's some clever countervailing argument that the person could give while well, I was brought up in the back of beyond where we had no radios. And if he can really prove this, you could say, OK, in that case, you, you did genuinely invent it and that's fine. So, but that's the sort of procedure that we'd have to go through. It, it, it might be complicated and occasionally and expensive occasionally, but then um, it's complicated and expensive to go shopping and you might think if you are some sort of a socialist, you know, if only we didn't have to bother with all this money, we just take what we want off the shelves and we walk out with it, say we, don't, we wouldn't need kittels, we wouldn't need checkout people, I mean, it would just, things would go wonderfully. No, they wouldn't, it would destroy the system. And not allowing people to keep the fruits of their intellectual Products. It's a disincentive for them to, to continue. And your great minds in physics and in, you know, inventors are disincentivized to continue. I think that's the strong argument for intellectual property, in my opinion. Uh, well, except that. Uh, Past a certain point, uh, people don't do it for the money, of course. So I mean, it's not that, I'm not saying intellectual property is compulsory. I mean, you can certainly give ideas away if you want to. <laughs> no. And a lot of physicists would, because that's, that's not how they make, they make their living, not by. Uh, Anybody who uses it's gravity from now on. <laughs> 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 um, Matt, first, yeah, about ideas being scarce. I think uh, when you use the term scarce, you mean that ideas are something concrete, that they are something we invent and something we get to know. But in terms of supply, like economically, when you have a supply of something, the real raw material objects are really scarce because when you use them in one field, you have to decrease the usage in the other field. So you have to affect in some way <coughs> production functions, production possibilities. So when I, for example, steal your bike, you have to go on foot. But if I copy your bike, you can still use your bike. So in terms of potential production possibilities, ideas are not scarce. Because once they are created, they actually increase the range of application of those ideas. And they, they increase production possibilities. Now, of course, there is some trade-off there. Uh, you, you are talking about incentives when you create, give patents and, and intellectual property. In some way, you give incentives to uh, create new things, to come up with new ideas. But on the other hand, you're also reducing it on the other side. So in general, it's really hard to decide to make uh, a profit and loss uh, analysis in there. But cannot we make a, a, a sort of Isesian anti-socialist argument saying that if those things are not scarce and they increase our intellectual potential and they basically say we can use our, our intellectual division of labor to use them as productively as possible. So we open up like 
new, completely new range of, of, of doing things, uh, isn't the case that this actually increases our production possibilities, so creating artificial scarcity in this sense actually decreases the potential. And, and to relate what you just said about uh, uh, the, the scarcity itself, uh, the, the boundary line, right? So uh, you cannot have an idea, actually, you only can have, uh, in terms of intellectual property, you can, only have, you can only own the particular implementation of the idea. And I cannot see justice in this. I cannot see why the person who invented GPS should have more economic claims on selling it than Einstein, like the brilliant genius who is actually responsible for it. Because without Einstein, there would be no GPS. Why the person who invented GPS is, 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 is more important? Is like why sh he should get all the credit other than Einstein and his, his children? Uh, I think Barack Obama beat you to it on that last argument with you did not build it. Um, of course we all rely on a background of culture but insofar as some things are freely available for us to draw on we don't impose on anybody else and insofar as we come up with some new twist maybe not greatly novel you know maybe a silly Christmas toy or something um, whatever ideas are they're not concrete uh, but the idea itself is one thing. Uh, the fact that anybody can be thinking about the idea, uh, it can be in different people's heads, doesn't mean that those are all different, you know, ideas. There's only one idea that other people happen to be thinking about. That one idea that you create, you want to be able to control that because that's, in many cases, that's why you created it. There's a, a to say there's an artificial scarcity, um, uh, as I said, in, in the sense that, well, we could use it and you've still got your idea. Well, you, can, you could say, well, <coughs> we can run off with what you've produced and you've still got your factory. Or I mean, maybe if what you produce doesn't cost very much too much to produce, you know, but you've, because it's made out of very, very cheap materials or something. I think you're just wrong the, about the... Uh, artificial scarcity uh, and that there be uh, an idea is somehow uh, yeah. a, a, there's a multiplicity uh, to its nature. There is only one thing that is that idea and to own that idea is to have some control over whether it's used or not in the same way that have control over a piece of land. is you know, it, The analogy there seems to be very strong. Uh, if you take away uh, the incentive immediately you at any particular time you will probably get a, a sort of a boost in production as people say okay now anybody can do anything with uh, this but that means you just undermined you're killing the goose that lays the golden eggs the golden eggs of ideas because they're either going to not produce them a lot of the time they're not going to produce them or they're not going to tell you about them um, so it's not that they get into the public domain for everybody to use, they'll be kept out because you know, we know that that's the only way we can control them maybe. So the, the, I think the more significant effect and the more likely effect is it's going to stop their production. And that's what I'm worried about. It, uh, and what's so peculiar here is that people who understand how uh, private property is efficient and how it tends to, you know, both efficiency and liberty somehow have this blind spot when it comes to ideas. And this is why I think uh, you know, Popper sort of helps because the, the, the reality of the intellectual realm uh, has to be taken seriously. There are real problems, real solutions, symphonies, books, and whatever, and they exist in this sort of intellectual realm, uh, which has a, an objective existence in the sense that anybody can check up on it and, uh, and sort of see what's there and what's not there and what the properties are. It has an objective existence which is highly analogous with the physical realm. Uh, it's not something sort of airy-fairy. and. That, uh, uh, what Popper does is he helps us to take that seriously and I think when you do take it seriously you just see well economics applies there as well and it's, an, it's a highly analogous uh, 
way in which it applies. There is no, the, the, the whole idea that, that artificial scarcity is completely wrong because there is only ever one intellectual object when it's created. A book, a poem, uh, an invention is a single intellectual object. Copies of it are not it. But you cannot completely consume it. You cannot use it up. That's the thing. Whereas with real property, you can consume it. You can't consume, you can't consume, consume the Earth. You can alter the state of the planet, but you can't consume the planet. The planet will carry on being here until, unless, there's a big, unless there's a big crunch. But I mean, you, you all, m most production is, 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 is not really creation. It's just changing matter from one state to another. In that sense, uh, you, we never create anything. anything. We simply move things around. But when you do something right now, you decrease the possible usage, at least on the, on the certain time horizon, this, which is not the case with the ideas. You do remove the use of the owner. If a, the owner creates it in order to have control of it, and you steal that from him, you've then taken from him the one thing that he wants. Yes, the I've. Well, maybe, maybe not the financial. But no, 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 no. The, 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 the financial benefit is, is separate. The reason why he wants to control it might or might not be for money. It's highly likely to be for money, but not necessarily. He may just say, I've created this idea and I want to decide who can use it and how for whatever reason uh, up until like the independent invention. And I always have to add this, of course, because uh, you know, it wouldn't, this wouldn't be uh, either... Uh, ad infinitum or set at some arbitrary limit. If, if, if plenty of other people might have come up with it, you will only get, say, the worth of what you've created, as it were, uh, and the control of it up to that point. Um, I just don't see any realistic way in which uh, you're creating artificial scarcity. There is this one thing, like one idea, one hotel. Uh, th there's a hotel on this spot here. Not everybody can own it, not everybody can use it. Somebody can have one idea, not everybody can own it, not everybody can use it. The owner of this hotel does what he or she or whoever likes with it. The owner of an idea should be able to do what they Now you can say, you can introduce ways in which there's artificial scarcity in the fact that not anybody can come in this hotel uh, without permission or and that sort of thing. I mean, I said, the, the analogies between inter the intellectual objects and physical objects are not perfect, but they're certainly sufficient, as far as I can see, for uh, the economic arguments to work just as well. And you just don't need to say, oh, well, that's just ideas, it doesn't matter. So given that one uses physical methods to defend physical property, what do you think of the idea that you could only use intellectual methods to defend intellectual property? Um, so it seems arbitrary. I mean, I mean, you can defend uh, any kind of property in a whole variety of ways. Um, uh, it, it mostly, uh, physical methods are uh, a threat. That's the, that's the last resort. Do you think it's acceptable to use physical methods to defend intellectual property? Of course. I mean, if... if, if uh... OK, somebody writes a book. Uh, pirated copies are made of that book. Um, I, I, if this, I'm a sort of assuming a society where, um, you know, this is understood and agreed that there, there can be intellectual property in a book, then you can seize the pirated copies and say, I'm sorry, you're just stealing the fruits of the labours of the person who created this book uh, by copying it and then selling it. Uh, of course, it's, I can't see anything wrong with seizing. I mean, ultimately, if you're going to protect property, uh, force is what you fall back on if they won't give in to, uh, you know, you give them a warning first and you tell them to stop and if they won't, you say, OK, well, then we're going to have to send in the papers. Intellectual to damage their reputation so everybody knows that they're not a pioneer in the field. Uh, it's very hard to damage the reputation of a pirate. I mean, uh, <laughs> that uh, Kim dot com, Kim dot com revels in his reputation of doing more or less what he likes with intellectual property without get, without getting into the details. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there are, it's, a, it's a complicated issue, and I can't really get into it. But, any, but the point is, you you can't shame pirates 
into changing the ways. I would argue that an idea is not a thing but an action. Uh, what? Sorry? I would argue that an idea is not a thing but an action. So if I'm a okay. idea, argue it. I, I write a song. What yeah. I'm doing is it's translating a neurochemical charge that's in my brain into my exercise of the administration of my body by moving my fingers over the fretboard of my guitar. That is the, the limits of the, uh, those are the concrete limits of the extent of my property. Ah, uh, yeah. You've, um, when you write an idea down, you thereby sort of make it objective in a way, and that's um, what Karl Popper calls World 3. Uh, strictly speaking, the, the, we need more than Karl Popper's three worlds to actually make full sense of what's going on here. Uh, there is uh, the material world, there are minds, and there are memes. Uh, but before any of this, we may say there are modes, there are just ways of being in the abstract sense. And that's really where ideas are. They're abstract, completely abstract. Once you write them down, you've, you've got them on paper. What you've got there is a, a key to how to get into touch with the idea. But the idea is, I mean, an idea isn't, is an, isn't an action. I don't, how can an idea be an action? A thought is a kind of action. If you say, I've been thinking all day, in a sense, you've been doing something. To think is to somehow move your brain around, in a, you know. Uh, but uh, there's no way that the idea itself is an action. That's like saying a hotel is an action. You needed action to create the hotel. But one it, once it's created, it isn't an action, it's just a thing. Yeah, but a hotel is a, a physical object. It's a concrete, sensible thing. Yeah, and, and, and an idea is uh, uh, an immaterial object, an inconcrete inconc thing, but it still has boundaries and limits and can be understood and passed on and it, it, there's no problem in uh, seeing what it is. Uh, I mean, it might be more complicated than we can fully understand, but uh, uh, so might this hotel. Nobody could ever know all the nooks and crannies of this hotel, but then the nooks and crannies of a complicated theory may well exceed what people can easily grasp, but I, it's a uh, and uh, something in the realm of ideas is no less real. Uh, a prime number, the highest prime number, if there is one, I mean, is a, it is a particular thing. Uh, it certainly isn't an action. How can an idea be an action? You can adapt an idea without affecting the original, the original idea. You might be stealing some of the original you can't, you can't, so if I want to adapt this glass, you know, change it, the glass will no longer be as it is. But if I want to adapt your idea, your idea would still be your idea. You know, you could walk away with your idea and it would still remain the same. Yeah. You would call those yeah. Yes, yeah. Well, this is where, you know, if I think I've had a, 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 a sort of pretty good idea for creating something that has value, and then you just take it and tweak it a bit, I will, maybe I would go to court and say, well, he just took my idea and tweaked it. I know he did add a little bit of value, but he's taken his little bit of value and all of my original value, which he didn't pay me for or did, you know, didn't have any contract, and he should have had a contract with me to take my original idea and then done his tweak, and then we could have done a deal instead you took the whole thing. So uh, the fact that an idea is uh, overlapping, as it were, with another, doesn't mean you can say, oh, well, this is, uh, this is I said, everything you said, you know, plus, with a brass button on or something, you know. Uh, you say, well, that's just basically the same idea. You obviously, you've st stolen the original idea. It's not enough that there be it, it be distinguishable in some uh, m trivial way. It's got to be genuinely original. But uh, if you do have some genuine addition that has value, then that would be yours. Uh, but uh, what you can do with that, of course, is trade with me or trade with other people concerning that. And how that would work out, I don't know. I mean, that's, it just all depends on whether I may say, no, I refuse to allow you to put your addition onto my idea until my intellectual property runs out, which is uh, another five years according to the court that we went to last year. It's very hard to enforce legal 
It's very hard to enforce legally, I don't see why. Okay. We're talking about a more sophisticated libertarian future where uh, uh, intellectual property is taken seriously and dealt with precisely. Okay, well, another question? Uh -huh. uh, just before my question, I was going to say that the, the action of the idea is a by, the action is a byproduct of the idea, so the thinking is original thought, because the action is the verb. The idea isn't, so, sorry, this was directed to Sebastian as well. <laughs> um, yeah, basically, the idea is the original thought, and it's not a verb because you've already thought about it. And the thinking of the idea was the actual verb and the action, whereas the idea yeah. is. I mean, that's the yeah. There's, there's a natural. Can I just answer that for? Uh, which is, I mean, there's a natural confusion. This is why you need to get away from uh, the language idea, because people think, well, if it's an idea, then it's in the brain, and it's something that the brain is doing. It's you think of, and I, I agree. Uh, I mean, that's where you have your ideas, but once you've created the, I the idea, as it were, it, what it is as an intellectual object isn't in the brain. It's, it's, it's completely abstract. Beethoven's Ninth Symphony is a complete abstraction that uh, you can have it instantiated in a printed form or in a, a, a form in which it's played, uh, but the thing itself now is completely separable. I mean, we obviously we have to go through a physical medium, and, and if we're going to enjoy it, it's got to go through our brains in some way. Uh, so even though we think of ideas, once they're, they, they become external in the same way that, uh, as I say, when you build a hotel, you know, you're, you, lots of action takes place, but then once you've finished, you step back, there it is. Once you've finished with an idea or a book or a poem, you step back, there it is. It's no longer part of you. You've objectified it. Yeah, I, was, I was going to say it's a byproduct of the actual action of the thought, so it's, you, you can always embellish on it and constantly act upon it, but the idea is not really an action at all. But my question, what I was going to say, I mean, I struggled to put those questions together, but I was, I was going to say when an idea has finitive limitations, how would you control the idea without not sharing it? Because when you share an idea, it's not that it loses its originality because other people can use it for their own benefit. Do you understand what I mean? Um, uh, how do you control it? I mean, there's a problem with um, uh, there's a problem with policing physical property, and there will be a problem with policing um, intellectual property always. And um, that, that, but you've got, of course, you've got to separate in principle whether it makes sense to have physical or intellectual property from how practical it is uh, and how it can be policed, and at what point you sort of give up and say. Uh, Beyond that point, we, you know, it's just not possible, and we have to forget about that. Uh, and there will be limits uh, whereby you just say well, we can't go into people's houses, and uh, you know, there's a, so. But that's not where the the problem really is anyway. The problem is people pirating it. And so, so as long as that's the real problem, that can be dealt with. But there will be economic limits to how far, uh, uh, and there's of course there are certain psychological limits in the sense that you can't explain an idea to somebody that they understand uh, and then them not think about it. I mean, it's, like, we, that's, it's in their head, it's there. If, if they can't sort of think, right, I will never think about that idea that you've given me. Oh, no, I'm not thinking about it. No. <laughs> just to, just to, 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 to think about whether you're not thinking about it is to think about it. But anyway, but there's no loss there, so that's not really a problem. And, 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 and I mean, you yeah. So, there's a question back. Please, last um, one. Just, uh, it seems to me that the only way that you can actually enforce intellectual property rights is by violating physical property rights. Because while, for example, with the book, while the guy can copy the content of your book, he has still put his own real resources into printing those copies. And in order to prevent him from selling it, you have to essentially seize the property. Just as you have to receive, uh, sorry, uh, sees the um, assets of the burglar who's broken into your house with a jemmy and he's got his swag bag and everything. And you say, well, yeah, I, I pay for all of those. And his stripy jersey, of course. <laughs> and and he, you've got to, you know, those are mine. Uh, well, I'm, yeah, yeah, and you, he put his time into it and he put his thought into it. And <laughs> it, it, Burglary is a complicated and, you know, business. But I'm sorry, the whole, if what you're doing is entirely illegitimate, then those things are going to be seized, and you can't have them. Uh, in fact, they can be even be seized uh, in advance because there's a crime of 
uh, going equipped to commit a burglary. You don't actually have to go into the house. You can just be walking along the road with the stripy jumper and the, and the bag of... <laughs> can I ask you one question? Yeah. Okay. Um, if I may, um, you know, take it out of the context of, uh, uh, of intellectual property for, uh, for a moment. Um, regarding what you said in the very beginning, uh, regarding you know, liberty in the centre or private property. You know, I would describe myself as a, um, as a proprietarian. Uh, yeah. You know, I think, you know, property comes uh, first and then I believe in, in, in liberty within the framework yes. of, of, private, of yeah. private property. And, you know, liberty is really uh, a meaningless term a meaningless political term mm. without that framework. Yeah. You know, almost every political position claim to advance liberty, even, yeah. Yeah. even communism. Would you reflect on that? Yeah, I think it's a very common error. I th and it's a, it's a complete and utter error, and an error of the first magnitude. And until we can correct this error and put liberty back at the centre, uh, libertarianism isn't really going to make progress uh, either uh, socially or even intellectually. It, it works like this. I'm going to I mean, make it very, very simple, but it's all in my book and I've got a few copies with me if anybody's interested. Uh, you, the reason you want private property and self-ownership is because if you think that the liberty of the individual is important, private property liberates you. Uh, you can do things without people interfering with you. If you own your own body, then and people can't do anything to you without your permission, then you have more liberty. Uh, uh, so if liberty means not being uh, sort of positively interfered with, you know, in a, in a proactive way by other people, then self-ownership and certain kinds of uh, external ownership will follow. But, but by putting it that way round, we can show how these things are congruent with liberty. If you say property comes first, then any system of property, you can say, what, however it was acquired, you can say, doing what you like with that kind of property. Okay, I own these slaves, who, I captured them, they're mine, nobody can take them from me, uh, otherwise they're interfering with my liberty. Now I want to say that is not um, an example of liberty in the libertarian sense, because it, it doesn't, libertarianism doesn't just fit any kind of property, it's got to be the kind of property where you're not actively aggressing against yeah. other people. But in, in a proprietarian order, you would have an, an ethical superstructure, and kind of the first principle would be that everybody would own their, their, their shelves, uh, themselves. Yeah, why? So there's a kind of a, a private, uh, you know, self self ownership. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I mean, I would say uh, uh, ethics comes later as well. First is a problem of what what liberty is and how it would apply in theory. It's a secondary and subsidiary issue whether Liberty is a good thing. It, you can't bundle it up with the idea that whatever liberty is, it's a good thing, and that's, it's got to be completely separate. Uh, so it that's doesn't sort of, it doesn't really solve the problem, and uh, that's another thing that people do. They often start talking about rights, but how do these rights relate to liberty in the first place? You need to see that if liberty is respected, then certain things must happen because that just means not interfering with individual liberty. Uh, then you can ask the question, and is it a good thing? I would say, oh yeah, it's a very good thing. It's productive, uh, it creates responsibility, all kinds of good things follow. And that's why we want it. But uh, if we ever get into a problem with any particular kind of property, such as intellectual property, if, if, when, if you start with, say, I believe in physical property, and that's what I believe in, and that's what I call libertarianism, then you sort of say, well, I can't, then you can't make any sense of intellectual property. They're just, that physical property is property. You don't have a theory of liberty, and that's a problem. Uh, if you're a libertarian, you ought to have a theory of liberty first, and then you ought to be able to say how, and it's not very difficult, self-ownership is a result of respecting people's liberty. Obviously, to, take, to seize somebody and use them as a slave is to interfere with that person's liberty. Obviously, to allow people to keep the fruits of their labours within you know, certain rules is, is, means you're not interfering with them, and that's liberty. So liberty is first, and whenever a problem arises, 
like intellectual property or anything else, or how, how, how do you uh, go about rectification in the event of somebody having committed a crime, you can go back to the theory of liberty and say, what follows from the theory of liberty as regards what's going on here, uh, what, what can be done that's compatible with the theory of liberty. Without the theory of liberty, we've simply got a proprietarian mess based on sort of historical ideas of material property and well that's how we've always done it and common law says this, um, uh, precedent says that. There is no theory and, that, that, and uh, that is the big problem. As soon as you put liberty at the centre, everything falls into place. It's, it's, it's the difference, as I said, between the geocentric view of the universe and the heliocentric view. The liberty-centred view, once you follow through all the arguments, it solves all of the problems that the private property-centred view can't solve and which critics of the private property-centred view see cannot be solved. No, I, would, uh, you know, I would disagree with you. Uh, you know, one of the advantages of, uh, you know, uh, to put property in, in the centre is that you, you know, allow, uh, you know, more forms of life are, are possible. You know, what would people that don't want to live in a, in a libertarian society want not to form some kind of, a, you know, communitarian society and within a proprietarian superstructure, within a proprietarian order, that would be perfectly uh, possible. Why, why is that not libertarian? Why is that not libertarian? Commun communitarian society on a voluntary basis is libertarian. It is. Communitarian society on a voluntary basis is libertarian. You say, well, it's not, it's not an alternative to libertarian society. Libertarian society isn't about the market. That's just, just, that's just one of the things that libertarianism allows. It allows you to be a monk or a nun or a, a communist or whatever on a voluntary basis. Or even a slave, if you want to contract in. <laughs> this is the best topic. Um, I think here we will leave it, but uh, thank you very much. Emma. Thank you.